Word of God is one of the most amazing things that we have access to. It's not a, it's not a religious book. It's not a doctrinal book. Um, it's not something that uh, is foolishness or ridiculous or religious or anything that people try and make it out to be. This is a book of testimony. There is a book, a powerful book of testimonies. Each and every one of us here has a testimony. And how do we overcome? We overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. So this is a book of overcoming. This is a book of power. It's a book of dominion. It's a book of authority. The problem is a lot of people don't believe this book. They don't believe the stories in it. They don't believe the teaching in it. They don't believe the word in it. They don't completely grab a hold of it and see it for what it truly is. It's a book of freedom. Every word in this book brings freedom. We've got to start believing that. And that's what we're going to talk about tonight. Trusting in him. Trust in him. Are we truly trusting in him? Are we truly believing and receiving the word of God? Are we truly taking it for what it really is? Because a lot of people are taking it lightly. A lot of people are not taking it for what it is. A lot of people are trampling on it. And it's, it's a time and season where we can no longer play games. Amen? We all know what's going on in the world. We all know what we're here for. We've talked about it a ton of times. But there's an area where we've got to draw a line in the sand. This is God's side. This is the devil's side. And we need to make sure that we are on God's side. And we're doing everything to maintain standing firm on God's side. Amen? Um, so in that, you look at somebody like Moses, all right? Moses had faith beyond faith beyond faith beyond faith. God spoke, he did. No grumbling, no complaining, no, no fighting. He may have wrestled with God or what have you, but at the end of the day, he did what God said all the way through. Then you have the Hebrews, who Moses was sent to set free. They had faith in God. They trusted in God. He set them free, but their faith was a little bit different than Moses' faith. Moses had the faith that keeps you on fire for good. The Hebrews had the kind of faith that dwindled when things didn't go their way. We need to be on fire like Moses was on fire. We need to be on fire like Elijah was on fire. We need to be on fire like Elisha was on fire. Those guys dropped everything that they had, left behind everyone, left behind everything, and they went after God, they went after his will, they went after what he said to do, and they saw it through. And that's what we're called to be like. That's what we are called to do. We gotta set the feelings aside, we gotta set our desires aside, we have to set aside the things that we want to do and sacrifice our life and see things through the way he wants us to. Amen? So, a question. Do we trust God like Moses? Or do we trust God like the Hebrews did? Moses was on fire. The Hebrews were wishy-washy. I don't want to be a wishy-washy Chris Christian. Amen? I just don't want to be that. I wasn't faking the world. I don't want to be faking the kingdom. Amen? So, let's get into one of these phenomenal, mind-blowing, awesome testimony stories in 2 Kings 6, starting at verse 8. Now, the king of Syria was making war against Israel. And he consulted with his servants, saying, my camp will be in such and such a place. So as we all know, the king of Syria was at war with, with Israel, all right? Um, so they were discussing, you know, war plans on bringing destruction upon Israel. Um, and the man of God sent to the king of Israel, saying, beware that you do not pass this place, for the Syrians are coming down. So this is Elisha. So Elisha, being the man of God that he was, was in tune with the Spirit of God. 
when you're in tune with the Spirit of God, God is going to inform you of upcoming attacks. Amen. So God was informing him, listen, these people are talking about bringing attack to this location. Let the people know don't go there. Amen. If you are not in tune with the Spirit, do you think you're going to get the warning before you step into a trap? No. It is critical that we maintain that level of trust in the Lord so that we can maintain that level of connection with the Holy Spirit so that when he speaks, we see it and we avoid the attacks and the plots of the enemy. Amen? Hallelujah. Let's continue. Then the king of Israel sent someone to the place of which the man of God had told him. Thus he warned him, and he was watchful there, not just once or twice. Therefore, the heart of the king of Syria was greatly troubled by this thing, and he called his servants and said to them, Will you not show me which of us is for the king of Israel? Yeah, he couldn't even understand what was going on. And one of his servants said, None, my lord, O king, but Elisha the prophet, who is in Israel, tells the king of Israel the words that you speak in your bedroom. I want that kind of faith. <laughs> When the Lord lets you know everything that the enemy is doing at all times. Amen. So he said, go and see where he is. So now he's trying to find out where Elijah is so he can try and kill him. Go and see where he is that I may send and get him. And it was told him saying, surely he is in Dothan. Therefore he sent horses and chariots and a great army there. And they came by night and surrounded the city. And when the servant of the man of God arose early and went out, there was an army surrounding the city with horses and chariots, and his servants said to him, Alas, my master, what shall we do? This dude was pooping in his pants, scared as could be. All he could see was this giant army around them, and he's flipping out. Man, what the heck are we going to do? So Elisha answered, Do not fear. For those who are with us are more than those who are with them. That is some eternal mindset thinking and seeing. And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray, open his eyes that he may see. Then the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses, horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. So when the Syrians came down to him, Elisha prayed to the Lord, and said, strike this people, I pray, with blindness. And he struck them with blindness, according to the word of Elisha. God made a divine, powerful way of escape. The biggest thing we have to understand is we are absolutely nothing without Jesus. We're nothing without him. We're nothing without trusting in Jesus. In order to acquire faith like this, you must press in. You must press in. Elisha is no different than any of us. Amen? We are called to have the same power, the same authority, the same dominion, the same sight, the same vision as men like Elisha. Those are testimonies that we need to be sharing with other individuals as well. He didn't acquire that kind of a relationship with the Lord by not spending time with the Lord. Amen. He didn't make excuses. He, when he was called to the Lord, laid everything behind, was a wealthy individual, dropped it all, left it, and followed after the Lord. And the problem with a lot of people is that they're not willing to make that decision. They're willing to give up some, but they're not willing to give up everything. And then sometimes they start willing to give up everything, and once they start acquiring some things, they start trying to take certain parts of their life back and only offer what they want to offer. Unacceptable in the eyes of the Lord. When we get home, we want to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. You were most blessed when you were here on earth, and this is what's waiting for you now. Welcome in. Amen? Press into him, man. All right, let's go to 2 Kings 5.
righteous requirements. You know, there's a, there's a process of conversion. There is a, um, there's a guideline. You know what I'm saying? There's a, there are set guidelines. There are set rules. There's divine order. There's divine position, which releases the divine nature of God. Without following through those divine steps, you do not get the outcome, the, the end result, which is the blessing of the Lord. If you take six steps in the right direction and your last two are out of order, you could end up in a bad place. Amen? So we must make sure that we not only start the race in divine order, but we finish the race in divine order. And this is, I mean, this is a phenomenal story. I, I love a lot of the stuff in the Old Testament, man, because there's some mind-blowing, awesome, divine testimonies in this, in this book. And it says, so we're starting at verse 1, 2 Kings 5, verse 1. It says, Now Naaman, commander of the army of the king of Syria, was a great and honorable man in the eyes of his master, because by him the Lord had given victory to Syria. He was also a mighty man of valor, but he was a leper. And the Syrians had gone out on raids and had brought back captive a young girl from the land of Israel. She waited on Naaman's wife. Then she said to her mistress, If only my master were with the prophet who was in Samaria, for he would heal him of his leprosy. And Naaman went in and told his master, saying, Thus and thus said the girl who is from the land of Israel. And the king of Syria said, Go now, and I will send a letter to the king of Israel. So he departed and took with him ten talents of silver, six thousand shekels of gold, and ten changes of clothing. Then he brought the letter to the king of Israel, which said, Now be advised, when this letter comes to you, that I have sent Naaman my servant to, that I have sent Naaman my servant to you, that you may heal him of his leprosy. And it happened when the king of Israel read the letter that he tore his clothes and said, Am I God to kill and make alive that this man sends a man to me to heal him of leprosy? Therefore, please consider and see how he seeks a quarrel with me. This dude's losing it, thinking, Who in the world am I to heal this guy? So it was when Elijah, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes that he sent to the king, saying, Why have you torn your clothes? Please let him come to me, and he shall know that there is a prophet in Israel. You know, one of the most powerful things that sticks out to me about this story, so Naaman, you know, he's a commander in the Syrian army, which is, you know, against Israel. They're against Israel. But he had favor in the eyes of the Lord. Um, you know, and it kind of reminds me of us, you know. We started out fighting against the Lord. You know, all of our lives we fought against the Lord. But even in that, God had a pre-appointed, designated time in life for us to have the opportunity to meet him. For us to have the opportunity to be healed, to be freed, to be um, rescued. Amen. It didn't matter about our life of sin. didn't matter about the things that we had done all the crimes we committed, all the dope that we did, all the people we robbed. It didn't matter how much we were against them. He had an appointed time in life for us to have a divine encounter with him. So, starting at nine again. Then Naaman went with his horses and chariot, and he stood at the door of Elijah's house. And Elisha sent a messenger to him, go and wash in the Jordan seven times. So he's giving him direct order. Exactly what he needs to do, all right? God gives us a direct order on exactly what we need to do to get healed, freed, rescued, delivered, so that we can help rescue. So Elisha sent a messenger to Naaman saying, Go wash in the Jordan seven times, and your flesh shall be restored to you, and you shall be clean. <laughs> this is the part I love. But Naaman became furious went away and said, indeed, I said to myself, myself, he surely will come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord, his God, and wave his hand over the place and heal the leprosy. How many of us had a plan in our mind of how our rescue and deliverance and healing and life was supposed to take place? I know I did when I first came to Total Freedom. I had a nine-month plan. 
and I had it planned out to the T, exactly what was going to happen. I found out very quickly that I was an idiot and that God had a plan that was actually going to last. And the plans that I make, they crumble because they're not backed by heaven. Amen? So at this point, he had a choice to make, which is how it came to all of us. We have a choice to make. So he pitched a fit because he thought it was supposed to go one way and he got told to do something else. And he said, are not the Abanon and the Farpar, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? Could I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away in rage. Sounds like an entitled, prideful crybaby. Not that I've ever been like that, but. And his servants came near and spoke to him and said, My father. Now these people are trying to bring reason to him. We all have people in our lives that have brought some reason to us and tried to get us to shut up, stop being babies, and take heed to the word of the Lord. So his servants said, his servants came near, spoke to him, and said, My father, if the prophet had told you to do something great, would you not have done it? How much more than when he says to you, wash and be clean? So he humbled himself. Doesn't say that here, but we know that's what happened. He humbled himself. He went down and dipped seven times in the Jordan. Not six, not five, not eight. He dipped seven times like he was told in the Jordan, according to the saying of the man of God, and his flesh was restored like the flesh of a little child. And he was clean. Healed, delivered, clean, and set free because he humbled himself, even though he thought things should have been one way. He died to himself. He said, I'm not going to go there. I'm going to do what the man of God told me to do. And he was healed and delivered and set free. And even more so, he gained, he gained salvation in the Lord. And it says, and he returned to the man of God and, and all his aides and came and stood before him and said, indeed now I know that there is no God in all the earth except in Israel. Now, therefore, please take a gift from your servant. But he said, as the Lord lives before whom I stand, I will receive nothing. And he urged him, take it. But Elisha refused. So Naaman said, then, it, then if not, please let your servant be given two mule loads of earth, for your servant will no longer offer either burnt offerings or sacrifice to other gods, but to the Lord. And he said, yet in this thing, may the Lord pardon your servant when my master goes into the temple of Ramon to worship there, and he leans on my hand and bow down in the temple of Ramon. When I bow down in the temple of Ramon, may the Lord please pardon your servant in this thing. Hallelujah. Entitlement and pride will cause you to miss the greatest blessing of your life. Don't allow that to happen. Where there is entitlement and pride, there is grumbling and complaining. Where there is complaining, there is no trust in God, which will cause you to live in bondage instead of receiving the healing, the freedom, the peace, and the salvation that God has predestined for us. Amen? Let's go to Psalms 103. So in this, you know, the Lord knows that we're knuckleheads. You know, he knows that we... We have a hard time with things. He knows we have weaknesses. He knows we have struggles. Um, but to those who truly trust in him, to those who truly have a heart seeking after him with everything that's within them, there's mercy and there's grace because your heart's true desire is to be pleasing to him. So there's an area where he understands. You know, we're human. We have problems. We deal with things. We go through things. We make mistakes. Amen. But we cry out to him. We repent. And we turn. So starting in verse 8. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in mercy. He will not always strive with us, nor will he keep his anger forever. He has not dealt with us according to our sins, thank God, or punished us according to our iniquities. For as the, as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is, is his mercy toward those who fear him. So again, as you're trusting in him, as you're resting in him, as you're waiting upon him, as you're seeking him, as you're truly surrendering all to him, putting all your trust and faith in him, he is merciful with us. Don't allow the enemy to beat you up. 
Don't allow the enemy to bombard you with fiery darts if you make a mistake. Pick yourself up, repent, turn, and move forward. Amen. But there's also an area where the Lord doesn't play games with those who keep doing the same thing over and over and over again. You know, mercy comes to those who are true seekers after him, who are truly maintaining that heart-to-heart -heart connection, who truly are seeking to please him and give him everything. Individuals who think they can do this, 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 and this, and I'll just repent later. It ain't happening. It doesn't work that way. Amen? Don't abuse what he's given us. Completely trusting in Jesus will cause his mercy to be upon you. He knows every weakness and every struggle we deal with. And when we fully surrender all, he will always see us through. He knows that we're always going through something. The deal is we need to make sure we go through it with him. Amen. Isaiah 12, starting at verse 1. Hallelujah. And it says, And in that day you will say, O Lord, I will praise you. Though you were angry with me, your anger is turned away, and you comfort me. Hallelujah. Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. For Yah the Lord is my strength and song. He also has become my salvation. Therefore, with, the joy, with joy, you will draw water from the wells of salvation. And in that day you will say, praise the Lord, call upon his name, declare his deeds among the peoples, make mention that his name is exalted, sing to the Lord, for he has done excellent things. This is known in all the earth, cry out and shout, O inhabitant of Zion, for great is the Holy One of Israel in your midst. You know, one of the, the coolest things that stuck out to me in this was verse 3, it says, therefore with joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation. That means cooperation. That means that it's our responsibility to maintain a spirit of joy. It says that you will draw joy from the well of salvation. Amen. So in order for you to stay on fire, to stay set apart, to stay sanctified, that means you have to put the work in. Amen. God's just not going to give it to you. You've got to put the work in. You have to be a seeker. You have to press in. Doesn't matter what you're going through. Doesn't matter what you're dealing with. You can't blame her. You can't blame him. You can't blame this person. You can't blame what you saw on the news. You can't blame what they're doing to the gas prices. You can't blame it on anything. You are responsible for you. The mirror is a wonderful place because the mirror is where you fix you, which is what God has designed us to do so that we can actually help other individuals fix themselves. Hallelujah. When you trust in him, the fire never goes out. It is our responsibility to maintain joy. Lack of trust in him is the reason why people become lukewarm and they end up falling. And everything we do, we must praise him in everything. No matter what it is, no matter what happened, no matter who's in the hospital, praise him. Praise him, praise him, praise him and he will show up, show out, and deliver you. So, just a, a few points that, you know, I was kind of going through this, and the Lord was sharing with me. There's a whole lot of stuff to do to maintain this, but um, one of the questions was, so how do we get to a place of complete trust and being on fire? Um, and what I saw was there are three keys. And key number one is denying yourself. So let's go to Mark 8.34. This is the basis of everything. Without it, you're not going to do anything for the kingdom. Hallelujah. Mark 8, starting at verse 34. Actually, only verse 34. 
And it says, When he had called the people to himself with his disciples also, he said to them, Whoever desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. You know, when I think of denying self, um, the word that comes to mind is sacrifice. Sacrifice everything that I want. Sacrifice everything that I want to do. Sacrifice myself for the name of the Lord. So, you know, when you hear deny yourself, we hear deny yourself all the time. You need to deny yourself. You need to sacrifice. You need to lay down what you want to do and allow the Lord to pull you through the process that he knows you need. We don't know what we need to do. We don't know what the right plan is. He does. But until you deny yourself and lay aside what you want to do, you'll never find out what that true, perfect will of God is for your life. We must learn to tell our flesh, no. No more excuses, no more compromise. It is time to deny self and be flames of fire for our king. It is time for a generation of Moses and Elijah to rise up. You know, the problem that we have a lot is um, you start off, you know you need a new life. You know you can't do it anymore. You know you need Jesus. So you get to a place, you meet Jesus. Like, oh, praise God, this is awesome. Start going through a little bit, start going through a little bit, you start getting a little bit closer, start getting touched. And like, man, this is phenomenal. This is what I've been looking for my whole life. Slowly, the enemy starts coming in and planting seeds of kids, of wives, husbands, homes, cars. And you're like, ah, I'm not worried about that. It's me and Jesus. Me and Jesus, that's it. Time goes on, time goes on. Somehow those seeds weren't squashed. Next thing you know, you're chasing a girl around, you're chasing a guy around, you're going after a job you're not supposed to go after, you're doing things you're not supposed to be doing. Next thing you know, you're falling off. This happens time and time and time and time again. <clears throat> I'm going to share something with you. All right, and this is a lot for the program people. If you are in the program, or if you are in your aftercare, it's not time for a boyfriend or a girlfriend. It's just not. And if you think it is, you're out of order. Bottom line. That's the bottom line. While you're in this program and while you're in your aftercare, your relationship is Jesus, 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 Jesus. That's it. Because without him, you'll never maintain a relationship with another person. Won't happen. I guarantee it. Focus on him. Deny yourself. Sever the flesh. There will be a time and season that God will bring everything. Just like with Naaman, he had a set guideline that he had to follow in order to receive his healing. We have set guidelines that we must follow in order to receive our healing. You can get all the way there to the edge. Do that one stupid thing and miss what was right around the corner. Don't let it happen. Don't let it happen. When you truly deny yourself, everything will come to you. You won't have to go looking for it. I had a conversation with a guy who was... Uh, a believer for maybe a year, came out of drugs, alcohol, crazy background, man, robbing, drug dealing, big time crazy gangster life. He's safe for a year on fire, talking all this God stuff. Next thing you know, he's having a conversation with me about all these girls he's dating on a stinking Christian dating service. They're like, who told you that? Are you serious right now? God did not tell you to go on a dating site, even though it said Christian, and find your wife there. That's not God. God will bring it to you when you see divine order all the way through. Amen? 
Number one is denying yourself. Number two is maintaining a pure heart and clean hands. Let's go to Matthew 3, verse 8. I'm not just here telling you things and, and whatever. I had to do this stuff. I had to practice. I had to pump my head. I had to crack my shin. You know, I had to go through it, and I had to learn. I had to see, you know, what, what God was actually trying to do. And one of the biggest things that was a struggle for me was my kids. You know, I had destroyed my children. I mean, utterly destroyed them, robbed them, um, I robbed my kids. You know, I mean, I was, I was out there big time. Um, destroyed my family. I destroyed everybody in my path. So for me, my heart's desire was to finally give my children the father that they had never had, the parent that they deserved and so longed for and never had. So when I was here early on, that was one of my things, you know, that I would really press into the Lord about. I was like, Lord, restore this for me, man. Like, give it to me, please. And um, he showed me this vision, and the vision was me and my children and my entire family. And we were standing in the palm of God's hand. And, you know, I saw his hand closing like this, and it closed, so it was, like, kind of covering us. And he was shaking it around and flipping it all around, and we were just cool, cozy, comfortable in his hand. And he was showing me that as long as I maintained position and stayed where he planted me, which is this house, that nothing could touch us, that my children's salvation, my salvation, my family's salvation was here in this house. And so, you know, for me, I was like, cool, let's get this thing started next month. You know, let's, let's get it going. But the biggest thing that I had said was, Lord, I don't want it if it's not going to last. So whatever it takes for it to be concrete, solid, planted on your foundation, I'm going to do it. And it took a lot of death to what I wanted. I wanted it now. We all want it now, but God's not about now all the time. He's about wait until you're ready. Amen? And that's what we have to come to grips with is we don't know better. He does. So we need to wait so that he can give it to us to where we're not going to trash it. I don't want to trash my kids anymore ever again. I don't ever want to put them through what they went through. And it was a long, hard road to get to a place where I could actually handle it, you know, and to God be the glory that he allowed that process to go on in my life is continuing to allow that process to go on in my life and restoring things with them. Finally, after seven or eight years, it's been, it's been a long haul, but praise God. But he answered my prayer, which was don't give it to me until I can handle it. Amen. And if you truly have a heart after the king, you will say stuff like that and truly mean it, and you'll see it through. Amen? Matthew 3. So, maintaining a pure heart and clean hands is number two. And I'm in the wrong spot. All right. Very simple. It says, therefore... Bear fruits worthy of repentance. That means you say you repent, your fruit's supposed to show it. You don't say, I repent, and then go back a week from now and do the same thing over again. And then say, I repent, and then go back two weeks later and do the same thing over again. Bear fruits worthy of repentance. And do not think to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father, for I say to you that God is able to raise up children to Abraham from these stones. And even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree which does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So know that this is a time for you to be exposed. We are all being exposed. We know it's the burn. We know it's the great shaking before the great revival. Allow the Lord to expose you. Allow those things to be cut off of you. Don't grumble and complain about it. Roll with the punches. Cut loose from the entanglements and affairs of this world. Let him free you up. Let him get you cleansed. And your amount of trust in him will grow through the roof. Submit to the pruning. When you trust him, you're always looking for conviction. 
Seeking conviction will cause you to maintain a pure heart and clean hands. We do this. We do this because we know that it pleases him and it keeps us hidden in the secret place under the wings of his protection. If you want to be off the enemy's radar, you maintain repentance. You maintain seeking conviction so that you can repent and turn so that the enemy does not have a wide open bullseye on you. Amen? God covers you when you have a pure heart and clean hands. And number three is staying grateful and thankful through everything, no matter what. And we're going to go to Ephesians 2. Ephesians 2, starting at verse 1. Everybody there? All right. Hallelujah. And it says, and you he made alive. That's you. All of us. And you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins. Don't take it for granted. We were dead, but now we are alive. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. And once you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath just as the others. How could we not be grateful and thankful all the time, man? I, I remember my misery and torment like it was yesterday. Not that I live in that, but I remember it and I know it, and it sickens me to think about going back to that, man. I mean, what a commiserating, terrible, tormenting life of bondage and just, ugh, nastiness. Stay grateful, man. I mean, don't forget where you came from. Remember those things. Remember how terrible it was. First thing the enemy tries to do when he gets you to try to step out of position is he tries to show you all the glorious times back in your time. And there were no glorious times. There were none. It's all a lie. Because anything that may have been any kind of fun in the worldly standpoint led to pure misery and torment and bondage. So don't bite the bait. No matter how hard it gets, you stand firm and you remember where you came from. But God, who was rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Maintaining an attitude of gratitude will cause you to walk in the favor of the Lord. Never forgetting where you came from and what God saved you from causes you to walk in humility, always giving glory to God for everything. And we're going to close at Hebrews 10. It's not just us. You know, there are people in the body of Christ all over the place that have lost their way. You know, they were once on fire. They were maybe not addicted or on drugs like us, but at some point in their life, they met Jesus. They had an encounter with Jesus. They got healed, delivered, set free. A lot of them praying in tongues, a lot of them um, moving in the spirit, doing works of the spirit, and have, you know, grown weary over time, have lost the fire. And this is a time for the body of Christ to rise up and grab a hold of that fire. Amen? This is a time where we need to be seeking after the Lord with everything we have. Whatever you lost, he will give it to you. It won't be what you had before. It'll be a new thing. But you must seek him. You must seek after him. You must repent. You must turn from your old ways. Get with him in a secret place, and he will fill you with fire. Because he is calling his warriors to battle in this time. 
because there are things coming that we don't even know about. But there's going to be a revival greater than we've ever seen before. And right now, the time is he is shaking his people, getting us cleansed, getting us pruned, getting us ready for the battle that's coming. And he's going to need people like us who know the truth to be witnesses, to be life-giving individuals to those that are out there in need. And if you're not filled with fire, you're going to burn. And it's not going to be a Holy Spirit burn. It's going to be a devil burn. And you're going to need one of us to come rescue your butt again. And there may not be a way of escape for you this time. So don't take it for granted. You know, for me, this, this scripture always stays with me, man. This is like an eye-opener of exactly what we were just talking about. You know, it doesn't matter if you're healed and delivered, praying in tongues, laying hands on people, filling people with the Holy Ghost and fire. We're all one decision away from falling off. We're all one decision away from going back. Amen. Ten twenty six through thirty one. Let me see here. All right, hallelujah. Hallelujah. We kind of talked about this already, but if we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth, has everybody here received the knowledge of the truth? At some point, has everybody in the body of Christ who has met Jesus, have they received the knowledge of the truth? Amen. So we're all accountable. So after we have received, for if we willfully sin, after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. So that lets you know right now, you cannot say, I believe in Jesus, I am saved by grace, and then go out and do whatever the heck you want. Because it says right here, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. Which means you're not covered by the blood anymore until you repent, turn, and get back to the position. And it says, but a, a certain fearful expectation of judgment and fiery indignation which will devour the adversaries. Anyone who has rejected Moses' law dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. He's talking about the Old Testimony. Of how much worse punishment do you suppose will he be thought worthy who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, counted the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified a common thing and insulted the Spirit of grace? For we know him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay says the Lord. And again, the Lord will judge his people. He will judge his people. He will bring them through the shaking. He will prune and sever. And if you're not grounded and rooted in him, you might not make it through. The Lord will judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. You know, for me, when I read that again, you know, it um, is just a reminder you know, don't give up. Don't give up. Don't forget where you came from. Don't allow the enemy to sway you. Don't let your struggles, your strifes, your bickering, your problems, your issues, your pains, don't let them dictate your decisions. Feelings will kill you. They will kill you. Get with him. Seek him. Press into him. Let him lead you and guide you. Let him be your comfort. Dip in to the joy, the well of salvation, and allow him to refresh you in his presence. There's times that we can all just get away, go somewhere, and just reach out to him. And I'm telling you, when you do that, he will meet you in that place. If you're a true seeker after him, willing to please him, wanting to please him, he will meet you in that secret place every time. So denying yourself which is sacrificing everything to allow him to lead the way, maintaining a pure heart and clean hands, and maintaining an attitude of gratitude are three major keys that will keep you in perfect peace because you completely trust him in everything. Amen. Hallelujah, Father, we love you and bless you. We thank you for your word, Lord. Let it go forth and bear fruit for your glory. Father, right now we take this time and repent. For any thought, word, or deed, any false agreement, anything that we may have been engaged with or entangled with, Lord, that was displeasing to you, anything that could cause us to stumble or cause somebody around us to stumble, Lord, we repent right now. 
we, we receive the washing of your blood. We sever all old things. We decree that old things have passed away and everything is new right now. So, Father, everybody here, everybody watching, everybody that's going to watch, let this be a new time and season for each and every one of us to go forth and bear fruit for your glory, leaving the old behind and stepping in to you now. We praise you, we bless you, and we honor you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.